I want to call the uh, Planning Commission of Count uh, Placer County to order for June 24th, 2021. Let's start with the flag salute. Please rise. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please, Sue. Yes, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Mr. Cannon. Here. Mr. DiMatte. Here. Uh, Mr. Sevison. Here. And Mr. Haugie. Here. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. It's important for Placer County to conduct our business to ensure essential services for our citizens. We're doing everything we can to facilitate residents staying at home and physical distancing. We encourage the public to engage in the process. With that in mind, our public comment for this meeting will be offered in person and through a remote virtual process. Citizens who wish to comment today and who are not here in person should be prepared to comment via the Zoom platform. To join virtually online, click on the link on the Planning Commission homepage. Please make sure your microphone is muted. You may also call in using our toll-free numbers to hear the meeting at 888-788-0099 or 877-853-5247. And please enter the webinar ID 955 Nine two seven six one seven three one. Please press star six to mute yourself. If you would like to make public comment virtually, please raise your hand with a hand icon at the bottom of the page. If you are calling in, please press star nine to raise your hand. Please be prepared to speak at the time I open the public comment for the specific item you would like to address, which may include public comment for matters not included on the agenda, a consent item, or a timed item. If attending in person today, we kindly request that once you have commented on your item, return to your seat or leave the hearing room from the exit door, uh, exit only door <clears throat> to accommodate for physical distancing and allow for others to provide in-person public comment. Each commenter is entitled to three minutes of comment time. Thank you for your patience as we work to preserve the safety and health of all meeting participants and to ensure that each citizen who wishes to comment has the opportunity to do so. At this time, uh, EJ, if you could give the planning director's report. All right. Good morning, Chairman, members of the commission. EJ Valdi with the Planning Services Division. Uh, I'd like to first report out on the Board of Supervisors meeting that we had on Tuesday. Uh, there were a few planning items on that. Uh, the AT&T cell tower appeal. Uh, if you remember that item, the board had taken tentative action on June 8th to uh, to uphold the appeal and deny the minor use permit for the cell facility. Uh, we brought back findings for such uh, on Tuesday and the board uh, took final action, uh, upheld the appeal and denied that, denied that cell tower. The Matranga height variance uh, was also considered on Tuesday uh, on a 5-0 vote. The board uh, upheld the Planning Commission's decision on that. Uh, they denied the appeal and denied the uh, height variance uh, for that uh, horse arena. Uh, most of the discussion was centered around compliance, you know, compliance with, you know, county development standards and codes and, and uh, you know, not setting a precedent. Uh, so there's, a, there's a, a very good, healthy discussion on that. But final decision was that was denied and the uh, applicant uh, and appellant, they have 180 days to either remove or uh, you know, rectify that structure so it meets a 36 foot height limit. Uh, and then uh, we also had a wound snap contract approved for 120 acres, uh, Thickworth. This was out in the Sheridan area. Uh, we now have over 32,900 acres under wound snap contracts in the county, and only about 2% of that is I have notices of non renewals been filed. That's where they the process uh, where it would uh, come out of contract within 10 years. So there's like 800 acres that are uh, under uh, notice right now, but over 32,000 acres under contract. Uh, upcoming board meetings, uh, July 6th, the baseline commercial center project is scheduled for that meeting. And then on July 26th is the Rancho Del Oro uh, uh, map modification. That appeal is tentatively scheduled for that date. That's on a Monday. Uh, that's going to be down here 
in Auburn, uh, and then there's a Tuesday uh, board meeting up in Tahoe on the 27th. Uh, let's see, planning commission schedule. Uh, we've, we've had items all over the board over the last <laughs> several several weeks and the upcoming months. I'm not sure where everything's going to land. Uh, the next meeting, July 8th, uh, we don't have any land use items on that hearing. Uh, we are tentatively scheduled to do the uh, have uh, county council provide the Brown Act, Brown Act and ethics uh, overview and training. Uh, but I kind of want to hear from the commission do you, if we want to keep that meeting and just have that uh, discussion at that meeting, bring everybody up here for that, or would you like to push that to the following meeting in July the twenty second? Uh, so it's kind of it's it's EJ. you can go either way. Yes, sir, uh, Commissioner Cannon. You're muted, uh, Sam. There you go. How about now? <clears throat> you are on live. Uh, I propose we uh, delay it. And I hear the three of us here also recommend delaying it. Okay, so uh, with that said, we will cancel our July 8th Planning Commission meeting, uh, and then we'll schedule that for the July 22nd uh, meeting along with other items that we have. Okay. And with that, uh, that. Can... I got no questions. Yes, sir. <laughs> I'm not allowed to stay home. <laughs> Time to go sailing, Larry. <laughs> There's thunderstorms up there today, so you may you may want to stay down the hill today. The lake's so low, I haven't even put a boat in this year. I've no. uh, I've heard that. <laughs> anyway, that's all I have uh, for my report. So, any other questions? Any other questions of the commission? Seeing none. No. Oh. I will now open the public comment for any matters not on the planning commission agenda. Uh, anyone in the audience who wants to speak on matters not on the agenda? And Sue, do we have anyone on Zoom? All right. So with that, um, with no other comment, public comment for matters not on the agenda is now closed. We will now move on to the consent agenda. Would any commissioners like to remove the one item from the consent agenda? Hearing no one wanting to do that, uh, we will now hear from the public. Is there anyone? In uh, Commissioner, I was oh. recused from the last meeting because I missed it. All right. Okay. Next, any public comments on the consent item? There's. I don't see anyone jumping up here in the audience. So, uh, Sue, anyone with their hand raised? All right. So I would accept the motion then to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Have a first. Second. Have a first and a second. Roll call, please. I have a first from Mr. Sevison, a second from Mr. DiMatte. Could I have a, uh, well, Mr. Cannon is going to abstain, so a vote for Mr. DiMatte. Yes. And Mr. Sevison. Uh, gee, okay, yes. And Mr. Haugie. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We are moving on to our first timed item, the Chance and Dean Rezone. I understand the staff is requesting the item be continued. I'll invite the staff planner, Amy Rosig, up to make that request. Amy. Good morning, Chairman, members of the Commission. My name is Amy Rossick with the Placer County Planning Services Division. The Chance and Dean rezone is a request to rezone a TPZ zone property. Um, to rezone a TPZ property, you can either do it an immediate rezone or a 10-year rollout, and the property owner has a request an immediate rezone, and so staff is requesting time to further analyze that request before we bring it before the Commission. So we would like to co continue the item to a open date. All right. Uh, commission have any questions of Amy? All right. Do we have any uh, public comments on this item? Okay. In that case, bring it back to the commission. Uh, 
We'll take a motion. Yeah, I'll make a motion that we um, postpone this until staff is ready to bring it back. Second. We have a first and a second. Uh, roll call, Sue. I have a first for Mr. DiMatteo, a second for Mr. Sevison. So vote for Mr. Cannon, please. Yes. Yes. Oh, excuse me. And a vote for Mr. DiMatteo. Yes. Mr. Sevison. Yes. Mr. Hauge. Yes. Thank you. Now I see that the Placer County 2021 redistricting is scheduled for 1045 and we're not there. Um, recommendation, Clayton, on what we do. Oh, no, I think we're at a, it's at 1010. 10, 10. Yes. So. Oh, yes. okay. I'm sorry, my yeah, agenda fine. has a different time. So 1010, we're, we're there. Bar barely good on that. So. Right on schedule, perfect job. <laughs> All right, so um, if we could have the presentation on redistricting, we'd appreciate it. Good morning, Nick. Mr. Chair, we have item uh, three or four. This is item, I'm sorry. Um, this is item oops, two, I believe, for at the Placer County 2021 redistricting workshop, all supervisory districts. Right. Yes, right. we're ready. Great. Uh, well, good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the commission, Nikki Stregan, senior planner with your planning. Um, services division I am here today to hold the first of four required meetings on the topic of redistricting so as you may know your Commission has been appointed by the Board of Supervisors as the advisory redistricting Commission uh, in helping to make map recommendations to the Board of Supervisors who will ultimately uh, approve new new supervisorial district boundaries later this year at the end of this year so the purpose of today's uh, meeting is to provide your commission and members of the public with an overview of the redistricting process to look at the timeline as we move forward uh, to look at some projected population uh, and demographic changes in the county which may affect new district boundaries as well as to receive questions and feedback from your commission and the public on the process I am going to first begin with a short video by your county clerk um, uh, recorder and elections officer Ryan Ronco to provide a brief overview, about three minute long video uh, on this topic. Hi, I'm Ryan Ronco, your Placer County Clerk, Recorder, Registrar of Voters. And I'm here to talk to you about redistricting, which is the process of adjusting or redrawing the lines of Placer County's five supervisorial districts. By law, this takes place every 10 years following the federal census and is happening in every county in California right now. District boundaries for federal, state, and local elected offices are redrawn to reflect new population data and shifting populations that are identified in the census. The five elected county supervisors are required to represent approximately the same number of residents and the district must reflect the county's diverse population. District lines can shape a community's ability to elect the representatives of their choice. So I encourage you to learn more about this process, get involved, and let your voice be heard. Why does redistricting matter to me? Redistricting determines which neighborhoods and communities are grouped together into a district which is represented by one elected supervisor. The county seeks input through a public process in redrawing the next district map. This means you have an opportunity to share how you think district boundaries should be drawn to best represent your community. To the extent practicable, district lines are adopted using the following criteria. First, a district must be geographically contiguous, meaning there cannot be pockets of land drawn that do not connect to the main district, and each supervisorial district should share a common border with the next. Second, 
all efforts should be made to minimize the division of local neighborhoods and communities. Third, the geographic integrity of a city or census designated place shall be respected in a manner that minimizes its division. Fourth, boundaries should be drawn along natural or man-made boundaries such as rivers and main streets. Fifth, districts shall be drawn to encourage geographic compactness, not bypassing nearby populated areas in favor of distant populated areas. And lastly, boundaries shall not be drawn for purposes of favoring or discriminating against a political party. How to get involved? Visit the Redistricting Placer website for more information. You can sign up to receive redistricting updates on topics such as future public hearings, workshops, view maps, or our online redistricting timeline. Most importantly, you can participate in the redistricting process by providing feedback online. You can even draw the area of your community that should be kept together. Who is responsible for deciding the new supervisorial district boundaries? The effort is supported by a multidisciplinary team of staff from the County Executive Office, the Elections Office, and the Community Development Resource Agency. Ultimately, the Board of Supervisors will take action to approve the final map. In accordance with a new state law, an advisory commission comprised of Placer County Planning Commission members will hold public hearings, receive public input, and ultimately make a recommendation to the Board of Supervisors. The process will include engagement from communities throughout public hearings and outreach that is designed to develop district boundaries that are representative of the county's diversity, population, and community geographic design. Visit our website for more information or to provide input. You can also email us with any of your questions. Thank you, and we hope you join in the process to help redraw your districts in Placer County. So, so that provides you with a, a lot of background, actually, on, on the, the process that we're beginning to engage in. Um, I'm going to provide a little bit more here um, uh, as far as uh, where, where the data is coming from. So census data, uh, it, which is completed every 10 years in accordance with the U.S. Constitution, that's collected and then delivered to states and local jurisdictions um, once it's processed. So the count for that census um, ended in October of 2020, a lot of delays based on the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and, and that data is currently being processed by the U.S. Census Bureau, and, and we won't have it until the fall. The data has um, great value. And sorry, I'm, should I flip back to the PowerPoint here on the main screen? Is that me? Jeremy, could you switch the, uh, <laughs> the main screen and the TV? Thank you. Mr. Chair, a uh, question? <clears throat> yes, Sam. Uh, what is the data on the county of Placer now? What's and the, how has it changed? I think she's going to be getting into that. So let, let Nikki finish her presentation, and then we'll uh, be open to ask our questions. OK, thank you. So um, so this, the census data obviously has great value when it comes to um, funding for schools, infrastructure, housing, based on federal funding formulas. Uh, but the data is also used to define state legislative districts um, as well as local districts. So the state legislative process is happening in parallel by the state on a, on a different timeline. Uh, but locally, we're, we're talking about the ability to redraw lines, uh, in particular county supervisorial district lines. So uh, we do this, as was mentioned in the video, to recognize shifts in population since the last census 10 years ago. Uh, and we also do this to comply with the Voting Rights Act uh, and the principle that each voter is equally represented in the voting process. So for those who are not familiar with current district lines, here is a, a map of the five current supervisorial districts. Each of, your, you know, each of the members of the Planning Commission represent each of these five. Um, and these are the lines that will be evaluated um, and, and um, amended during the process. District's huge. <laughs> uh, as was also mentioned in the video, the effort is done, uh, undertaken by a multidisciplinary team of staff. 
Um, the county's assistant county executive officer, Jane Christensen, who's in our audience today, has made three previous presentations to the board on this topic, which are outlined on the slide before you. So January 26 was the first visit where a proposed timeline was uh, brought forward. February 9th, that timeline was amended because there have been so many shifts and changes in um, some legislation and when, when uh, data will be received. Uh, but it was at that meeting that the board appointed your planning commission as the advisory uh, redistricting commission. And um, when we were sort of more um, aware of the data delays with the U.S. Census Bureau, which, uh, you know, we are, we are uh, aware of them insofar as we know the timeline is going to be significantly compressed. And we'll take a look at that in the next slide. Um, but it was also at that meeting that the board directed staff to proceed with developing a redistricting plan. So uh, another, another trip was made to the board in May. Again, you know, taking a look at some updates to some legislation that may provide some relief related um, to uh, the, the deadlines uh, as well as an updated timeline. Uh, the California Elections Code uh, provides priority criteria and outlines procedural requirements uh, for the board to follow. And the map making process fundamentally centers on the uh, redistricting principles before you on the slide. Uh, those are to comply with the U.S. Constitution's Equal Protection Clause, to comply with the California Voters' Rights Act, uh, and to reach population equality or parity in each district as nearly as practicable. The um, Priorities in front of you are, are given consideration based on, um, uh, rather the, the, the map lines are um, given consideration based on the following priorities in, in this order. And again, um, Mr. Ronco spoke to these in the presentation, but uh, districts need to be contiguous. The integrity of neighborhoods and communities of interest shall be respected. The integrity of cities and census designated places shall be respected. Uh, we use natural and artificial barriers, including streets and other topography, to help define lines, um, as well as geographic compactness. It was also mentioned that in addition, the boundaries shall not be defined for the purposes of favoring or discriminating against any political party. And I'm going to um, jump back up to communities of interest, since we're going to talk a little bit about that later in the presentation. Those are mappable and geographic areas that have common social and economic interests um, that should be included in a single district, so not divided, in order to uh, provide fair and effective representation. And those can be based on a number of things. They can be based on economic factors, so a major employer, for example, may want to re be retained in a single district. They can be based on demography, so income, um, education, language, spoken, and housing can, can fall into that category. Uh, they can be based on political subdivisions, so planning areas, and we'll take a look at that, can, can be retained in a single district. Or they can be place-based issues. For example, a public safety issue based on wildfire might be, you know, there may be a community um, that is uh, in the same geography that should be retained together for the purposes of tackling that issue and addressing that issue. Could I ask a question? Sure. I'm sorry to interrupt your presentation. Of those issues that you just had on the, on the uh, screen, uh, number five, geographic compactness. Under that, the fifth district, which I happen to live in and have been affiliated with, has had the disadvantage, of course, that it's... Uh, we get a huge influx of people and very few voters. And so it, I, I guess I, I'm always looking for some way to even that out some way if we could. But uh, geographic compactness, of course, it doesn't fit this district. It's just what it is, and, and it's just a wide open space for the most part. And, and it's filled with tourists that don't vote here. And so... <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm always looking for some way to kind of level that out for the the people that have to right. live and run in that district. And uh, uh, I just, 
If you come across ideas, I'd be really happy to hear them. <laughs> sure, yeah. Right, and the, the 5th District is one of the least populated districts, which is why it's as large as it is. As it is. It's also one of your more rural districts, right? So, um, and correct, uh, tourists and visitors are, you know, when they take their census, they're taking, you take it from where your primary residence is, where your home is. So that's how they, f they fill it out. That, that, may have, that may have been a little different last summer, depend, you know, depending on where people were when they um, took their census. But they, they, the directions on the census are to fill it out where your primary residence is. Well, it's a strange phenomenon because I drove out of my driveway this morning at 7 o'clock or whatever it was, and I couldn't get out of the driveway for mm -hmm. traffic. It was just jammed in all directions. <laughs> Yeah. And so it's it's kind of an unusual situation, and somehow as we work our way through this process, I'd, I'd like to try to compensate a little for that if we can, because it's it's getting worse by the day and the year uh, as we go through time, because uh, more and more people are coming out of the Sacramento Valley and the San Francisco Bay Area and calling that home now. <laughs> And my next door neighbor flies in from the east in his private plane, <laughs> and so you know we're we're being inundated with with sort of tourist people in a way, and we and I'd, I'd like to try to find some way to balance that a little bit if we could just think about. I don't know what I don't have an answer, but I have the problem. <laughs> so, so I guess surgery, huh? <laughs> Thank you. All right, I'll keep going here. Um, so Mr. Chair, if I may interrupt. Yes. Sam. Uh, I believe the commissioner has a very valid point, and we should consider that with our um, <clears throat> long-term recommendations on how we're going to deal with the uh, Lake Tahoe uh, project. That's all. Okay, thank you, Sam. All right, Nikki. Great. So, so the county's process is in its early stages, but it's it's certainly underway. And today, of course, marks the first advisory commission meeting, um, uh, and a number of work has been done as far as public outreach and education, including some presentations to city councils uh, throughout the county, along with some other outreach, which we'll we'll discuss. Um, uh, some community meetings you can see are going to take place over the course of the summer. Those were actually just calendared as of yesterday and they'll show up on our website later today. But in the month of August, that's when um, a lot of work will be done um, uh, doing community meetings and those kinds of things to sort of get the word out about participating and s in the surveying process. The census data won't be delivered until September 24th. So the month of September um, is quite a ways off, and of course we're trying to do as much work as we can on outreach and education and collecting information from the community before then. Um, and then you'll see staff return in the fall with two public hearings uh, for your commission and then um, a final adoption hearing with the Board of Supervisors, our deadline um, to have maps uh, ready and adopted is December 15th. Um, and depending on how it, it is adopted, whether by ordinance or resolution, we may need to make it to the board well before then. So, uh, you know, trying to do as much as we can, but you can see how compressed uh, that, that time period is between when census data is delivered and when we can actually get to hearings for a review and adoption. So here's a, here's a little look, a look at some of the work that's been done. I mentioned um, some presentations that have already been done with the board in January and February. In the months of February and May, staff um, has taken a look at some preliminary um, old, I should say, 2019 census data, so projections, statistical projections, not 2020 census data, but just looked at some trending information. Uh, there's a, a, a bill in the works which is, you know, um, um, you know not, uh, not passed yet and, and kind of on the on the fringes of not being passed, but SB 594 provides a little bit of relief related to some of the deadlines that counties are up against. Um, and then, of course, you know, we've, we've been to the board on, on that matter. Today marks, as I mentioned, the first commission meeting with uh, your commission. Through the months of uh, um, July, September, we'll be doing some additional outreach, and I had mentioned in the month of August, those sub-regional community meetings are scheduled. Uh, we'll be back to your commission in the fall, and then November, December is the timeline to get to the Board of Supervisors. Uh, 
I, I wanted to take some time to talk also about considerations for local criteria, which um, your commission as well as the public may have thoughts on. So historically, we have also looked at community plan boundaries, which your commission is very familiar with from uh, being the planning commission. Uh, consideration for specific plan areas uh, and evaluating those as related to map boundaries. Uh, historically, we've, got, we've also looked at no city being represented by more than two districts, uh, as well as each district sort of having a balance of rural and urban constituents. And we have some mapping that can, you know, in the slide deck later on, if this is something you'd like to see visually, uh, but this is some consideration that, that your commission and um, the community may want to, to contemplate. So putting that into a, a table form, you can see, um, and, into the, and, and into more of a planning context, you can see how the districts compare to each other now. Uh, District 1 includes parts of the city of Roseville, uh, as well as some specific plan growth areas. Uh, District 2 includes the city, uh, and I should say tremendous specific plan growth area, especially in the city of Roseville. Um, District 2 includes the cities of Lincoln and Rockland, and, and s most of rural Lincoln, um, and goes all the way up to the, the northern and western boundary for the county. District 3 includes the city of Rockland and the town of Loomis, as well as portions of North Auburn, including the Placer County Government Center, and, all, and most of the rural communities along the I-80 corridor, including Newcastle, Penryn, and Ophir. Oop, uh, I'm going to back up. Oops. District 4 includes parts of the city of Roseville and Granite Bay, all of the community of Granite Bay. And then District 5, as was mentioned, the largest uh, district as far as geography includes the cities of Auburn and Colfax, the entire western Sierra, Sierra Nevada foothill area to the eastern Sierra Nevada and, and the Tahoe Basin. Uh, most of the community plans, as you can see, are in this area, um, which represents Auburn Bowman, Meadow Vista, Weimar Applegate, Forest Hill, uh, and then some other um, area plans and plans like Martis Valley, Squaw Valley, Alpine Meadows, and the Tahoe Basin. So yes, a very large district indeed. Uh, earlier, I, I discussed a timeline, and I noted that the adjusted census data won't be available until September of 21. The data that we're looking at on this slide is from statistical projections and a data source known as the American Community Survey. So that's um, some, some data that the Census Bureau does put out. It is from 2019. Um, and, you know, in between decennial censuses, it's the data set that, you know, folks use, researchers, local government, and other organizations use to make projections um, about and take, take data and evaluate data from populations. So based on that 2019 American Community Survey data, we see a 10.6 increase in Placer County residents over the past decade. So that's an increase from roughly 350,000 people to 385,000 people. And the figure before you today shows the breakdown by race. And you can see that Placer County is comprised of a 70% white population, 14% Hispanic Latino population, 7% Asian population, 2% black population, and a less than 1% population of American Indian, Eskimo, Aleut, uh, Native Hawaiian, and other Pacific Islander, uh, those identifying as other race, and those identifying as two or more races. You two or more races? Uh, th this Are slide. You two or more races, the last category? This slide shows the percent change in population. Uh, so, right along the 0% line is sort of where you want to focus. Everything that falls to the left of that shows a decline in population by race, and everything to the right of that 0% shows an increase in population by rate. So, by race. And so, you can see declines in um, American Indian, Eskimo, Aleut. Uh, Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islander and persons identifying as other. And then increases in black, Asian, and those identifying as two or more races in the order of 25 to 30%. Uh, we also see increases in um, Hispanic and Latino populations by 17% and an increase in white alone population by 5%. So this slide um, you can interpret as the county becoming more diverse over the past decade. 
this figure shows a comparative race, racial composition relative to the entire state of California. So the green bar represents Placer County, and the blue bars represent the state of California. Uh, you know, from, from this, you know, and, and the previous slide, we can conclude what, that while the while Placer County is becoming more diverse, it's not as diverse as the state of California as a whole. So as an example, um, uh, the state of California as a whole has a Hispanic Latino population of nearly 40 percent, while Placer County's population is 14 percent, so not quite as diverse as the state of California. Uh, the same is true for black and Asian populations, uh, and a greater percentage of, there are a greater percentage of black and Asian populations statewide, but a smaller percentage in Placer County. So I, um, I, the community outreach effort, uh, you know, I don't think we can emphasize enough during this, uh, during this meeting that it is a critical part of the public process um, and also why we're, we're here and kicking off this process with your commission today um, to ensure that members of the public know how that they, they can participate and so that your commission understands um, what task is before you. Right, there's one more. Um, as part of the outreach effort, the county launched a website on May 11th, and today we're officially launching a survey to help identify communities of, communities of interest. And I'm going to give you a tour of the website and that survey at the end of the presentation. Um, but some of the other strategies that we're employing include uh, news releases and media outreach with every meeting um, and milestone that we hit. Uh, the public information office is playing a role in this process and using their social media um, accounts to promote redistricting, uh, as well as promoting this in weekly newsletters and email blasts. Uh, the, the regional stakeholder meetings that I mentioned are, are scheduled, and so we are intending to, um, to, to hold those over the course of the summer. Those stakeholders not only include you know, general members of the public, but they also include some other partners like school districts, um, Placer County Water Agency, which holds actually co-terminus lines with county with supervisorial district boundaries. So they're a major stakeholder, um, along with uh, we've, we're engaging Placer County's uh, 2020 census outreach partners in the effort as well. Um, and our elections office has sent letters inviting them to, to many of these meetings so that um, everyone can participate. So how can uh, the public participate? Uh, start, starting now, starting uh, you know, as, as soon as folks can, following the county on social media, visiting the website that we'll, we'll um, share, and signing up for updates on that website are uh, key pieces. And then taking the survey that I will walk you through later is also, um, is also an important part of participation. So here's a snapshot of the website. Uh, it's placer.ca.gov forward slash redistricting. And it is home to a public meeting schedule, frequently asked questions, um, a mapping hub, which um, shows not only the existing districts and you know, the, w the a way to find where you are, where your home is in relation to a district, but it will have um, information related to the survey, which is an online mapping tool. Um, and be home to a place where folks can download, you know, what, as the process uh, ends, where folks can download map file data and that kind of thing. Um, and then I'm going to give you a peek of this. So here's a, here's a quick snapshot of that survey, uh, which helps um, provide data on um, definition of, of a community of interest. Um, we talked a little bit about communities of interest and really where we're at in the process, short of getting data from the U.S. Census Bureau, is the process to collect some information from, from our communities. So the survey is designed to collect that data by asking these three brief questions that you see on the screen. Uh, what bonds your community? Where is it located, which you can answer narratively? And why should it be kept together or separate from another area? And then the final step is the opportunity to draw your community using a mapping tool, an online mapping tool. Um, and so I, I want to encourage everyone to use the online tool. We do have hard copies 
Um, and our, our table set up back here has hard copies along with maps that folks can actually draw on. Uh, this kit of materials will travel around to our sub-regional meetings so folks have the opportunity um, to, to participate in that way. They can be emailed to redistricting at placer.ca.gov or mailed into our office. That information is provided in the staff report or brought into the office. However, however folks want to provide uh, information, we, we can uh, receive it. Uh, so I'm going to give you a tour of the website and this survey right now, and then I will stop talking, and you can ask some questions. So here's, here's a look at the website. You can see um, all of the meetings are found in this header up here. Uh, you can sign up for updates on a, no a number of different ways, um, either through this button or in the far right over here. Um, it will take you to a page where you'll just have to uh, include your email, and then you'll be provided with information as far as when hearings are occurring or when other meetings are occurring. Um, and then the FAQs, of course, are a great resource for folks who are interested in learning a little more about the process. What is it? Why does it matter to me? Um, what's the criteria? How will the public be notified? Who's responsible? Those, those kinds of questions are all answered here on the website. And then the mapping hub is something that I wanted to um, take you to. Because right now it, it shows the current districts and a function to uh, find your own supervisor district by plugging in your current web address or your current um, physical address. And then I had mentioned um, taking the survey. So again, this survey is available online and then we have some hard copies in the back. We'll also have some PDFs that are downloadable from this site. Um, but this survey is, is designed um, to identify communities of interest. So I'm going to show you how it works. They ask for your name, email, and zip code. We do collect zip. And then um, the first question, what bonds your community? What do you see as the common links in your community? I'm going to... Um, you know, as an example, I'm going to select wildfire as an issue that bonds my community. So I'm concerned about wildfire in my community and surrounding communities. Um, where, is your, where is your community located? I'm going to say North Auburn, you know, along the American River Canyon. North Auburn, no, Auburn, 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 I'm going to say <laughs> American, what kind of planner am I? Um, American River Canyon, <laughs> um, let's say American River Canyon in Weimar, right? Yep, I spell Weimar right? There we go. <laughs> Um, why should it be kept together separate from another area? Um, you know, I think this issue um, is important for public safety. <laughs> and then I'm going to show you how to draw the area down here really quickly. So um, this on the right, this, this is called a, like a polygon icon, and, and there are instructions on this. Uh, but uh, this icon right here will help me to draw the location. Uh, and I'm going to zoom in to Weimar. My two. Oh my goodness. I just drove down here. Where am I? <laughs> <laughs> you know, okay, here's what I'm going to do I'm just going to draw from Colfax all the way along the I 80 <laughs> corridor. Because this is where I'm concerned about. Um, just as an example, this is an example. So this whole area is uh, the, the geographic area that is my community of interest. Um, 
hit the submit button, and that data is provided to um, staff who's going to be reviewing and looking at them against certain criteria. But is, it is a way, again, I had, you know, there's a lot of different types of communities of interest. Um, it is one way to map those, and they have to be mappable. They are mappable. So that's, that's the survey in a nutshell, and um, I am happy to answer questions if you have them. Thank you, Nikki. Um, Commission, I know, Sam, you had some questions of Nikki. He's taking it now. Yeah. You're muted, Sam. Nick, yes. Yeah, there you go. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Describe for me what's going on in the western portion of Placer, which is my district one, and how that impacts your studies, please, if you don't mind. I'm going I'm to answer this at a really high level, Commissioner Cannon, because we don't have data yet uh, from the Bureau. But uh, what we do know is that there was, where, where growth occurred in the county, it did occur in Western Placer County. So the cities of Roseville, Rockland, um, and Lincoln grew again, um, not quite to the, uh, to the levels that they did between 2000 and 2010. But they did grow, so uh, districts one, two, and three uh, can anticipate an increase in population, and in order to uh, make up for that growth, you know the, the lines would have to shift uh, a, a bit to create population equality or parity in each of the districts. And we won't be able to see that data. You know, we can probably see some trending data at the next the next time we uh, revisit the commission, but we we won't be able to know until we have 2020 census data in hand. Okay. Other questions, Sam? Thank you very much. All right. Other commissioners? Yeah, thanks, Nikki. Oh, that was great. Um, is there, um, obviously, there's numbers of permits that were pulled for housing. Um, can we get those numbers ahead of the census so we can have a housing number in those three districts with permits that were pulled in the last maybe? 10 years to kind of go with the census of how many people may be living in those houses? Yes, yeah. Um, I think that Shauna's team is actually working on tracking some of this stuff. Uh, but I mean, we certainly know what's entitled. Um, but as far right. as building permits that have been pulled but are not quite occupied yet, that is data we can, can start to pull and just anticipate uh, growth, growth in those areas. So will that also take into consideration Western Lincoln, where they're going to add more homes that won't be part of this census that will obviously give it a different population growth here in the next three or four years? Right, yeah, the, all the village, referring to some of the village development? Correct. Yeah, um, so I mean, the, the census data that we'll receive is for people who, you know, will get population counts from people who are actually physically living in homes from last year. Um, but your commission may want to anticipate where the village um, village approvals are, where the specific plans, even in unincorporated Placer County, are. Right. That may certainly be a part of where you want to draw lines and sort of respect those boundaries. Is that allowed yeah. under uh, rules? Yeah, um, we can. We can. Um, so long as we're taking into account the state and federal criteria, we can consider local okay. criteria like specific plan boundaries. All right. Thank you. Other questions. Larry? Well, I can't help but have to bring up TRPA <laughs> with the 5th District, uh, which is, uh, for those that may not be familiar with it, it's a land use planning agency that's limited extensively the amount of growth that could take place in that end of the county, which uh, I don't know how you can compensate. I don't really have the answer. I just have the problem, and I've been involved in it for so many years now that it's it's just a frustration that uh, we have a lot of people now coming to the lake and using every rental house and every piece of property, and yet we we can't seem to get any relief from it because we can't grow. We just simply can't grow because of the regional government, the TRPA, and so forth. And I, I sure would like to find some the means to augment that or somehow minimize it so that 
uh, we're having to provide, you know, services, whether it's police or planning or what it is, it's, it, we just can't get there from here. <laughs> And uh, I'm not sure how to overcome it. And I don't think anybody else has come up with a solution other than maybe creating special, some sort of special planning districts or something. I'm not sure what it is, but I don't have the a answer or the solution, but I still have the problem. <laughs> and, I, and I'm sure you folks have wrestled with this a fair amount in getting to this point, but there's just no way to overcome that. You know, you can't get there legislatively. You can't get there by changing boundaries. You can't create cities where they're not going to be the services to do it. So I think we're just a, a victim of uh, growth and history and planning. And it's, it's kind of too bad because we get right now on a busy weekend it's it's really busy up there <laughs> but we don't have the services and we don't have the ability to and then not on top of that they've chosen to replace the main sewer line around the north shore of lake tahoe this morning <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and the traffic is absolutely at a standstill at six o'clock this morning so at any rate i'm not sure what the problem is but i just wanted to bring it up and talk about it a little bit and maybe as we go through the process look at any options that may and then we keep we keep moving the boundary towards Auburn and pretty soon it's going to include most of the city of Auburn in the fifth district and all that does is move the center of government down to Auburn <laughs> so uh, but we still have TRPA. We still have other things on our, uh, that we have to deal with in the basin. I'm not sure what the answer is. I'm just outlining the problem. Sure. <laughs> Sorry to take your time. Uh, no problem. Actually, Nikki, given kind of we can look at future development, can we look at uh, things such as people moving in full time into the Tahoe Basin or recognize the amount of activity that occurs both in the winter peak and summer peak seasons in order Mr. To Chair. I, I'm just a minute. Nikki's going to answer my question. Yeah. Uh, and sorry, these were the maps related to specific plans and community plans. I thought right. that's where you were headed. Um, right. You know, unfortunately, the, the data, though, is based on, uh, you know, the existing population where people are living. All right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that, those are, that's, that's the criteria we're working with. And um, uh, like I said, the, the 2020 census data is going to take into account uh, you know, where people filled out their census form right. and what they noted as where their primary residence was. So I, I understand okay. the, you know, the influx and the uniqueness of, of East Placer. Um, but for the purposes of drawing district boundary lines, it is based on population. All right. Thank you, Nikki. Sam, you had a comment? Sorry, my dog is barking. Um, <clears throat> Nikki, yes, I do appreciate your presentation and pardon my background noise. But I do believe that there's a legislative uh, fix for this. So I'd like your uh, input on that, please, if you don't mind. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Right. Yeah. Let the dog vote. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I'm not. I not go. I don't know how the answer to that question. Looks like Clinton might. But okay. Yeah. So I just want to make sure I understand the the question right, Commissioner Cannon. That whether there's a legislative fix to I guess, adjusting the district boundaries with respect to Tahoe is that the the question that you're asking? It is indeed, Mr. Cook, okay. and um, well, I believe there is a remedy. So, so um, with respect to redistricting and, and drawing the maps, all of the districts need to be roughly the same uh, population-wise. Uh, they do allow for a deviation of 5% between districts. So you can, if you are anticipating one district, uh, I guess, potentially having more growth, you could potentially 
um, lower that district amount f in comparison to the other districts as long as you're still within that 5% range um, to anticipate for growth uh, in the future. If uh, you're talking about legislative fixes, though, I, the only one that comes to mind is one that was discussed by the Charter Review Committee, and that is you could expand the number of districts within the county. Uh, right now there's five districts. You could um, expand that district amount to six or seven, and the Charter Review Committee did ultimately look at that. Uh, the downside of that, though, is uh, then you would have seven districts, and um, Tahoe would be representing one of those, which would just uh, decrease the, um, the weight of that vote because um, it would be one-seventh as opposed to one-fifth. Um, but that is, I guess, a, a potential legislative fix. I know the Charter Review Committee ultimately decided against doing that because of some of the factors um, that, that go with adding more districts, but that, um, that certainly could be discussed, too. Yes, Mr. Cook, may I speak? Commissioner? Yes. Uh, Chair? Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes, you may speak. Um, here's my thoughts on that, because I was on the Charter Review Commission for the City of Roseville. So that's my district, you know, one. And um, the preponderance of the population of Placer County is in my district, one. So we do need to evaluate that uh, as a part of what you were just saying, Mr. Cook. You know what I mean? All right. Other questions of the commission? No, that's all, Mr. Chair. I'm sorry. Yeah. And right. to the extent that there is an inquiry or question about, uh, I guess, adding districts, um, that's probably beyond the redistricting scope, but some, certainly something that could be included in a recommendation of the Board of Supervisors. All right. Thank you. Nikki, just one observation. Uh, in your mapping exercise, what's my community? One of the things I know the county is looking at right now is uh, in District 5, new mapping for the max, which I thought actually reflected those areas pretty well. Mm -hmm. And if somebody could just click on, I agree that that's my area, would be helpful on that okay. mapping process. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Other questions of the commission? All right. If not, uh, we'll now open uh, the podium for public comment. Uh, we'll start with persons here in the audience. Good new old planning commissioners can talk. <laughs> Morning, Commissioners. Wayne Nader. Um, I'm going to kind of follow on what Clayton had to say and some of the issues that uh, Commissioner Severinson said about District 5. I'm going to spend some time talking about that. I served on the uh, Placer County Charter Review Committee uh, in 2019 that went into 2020. And uh, one of the topics that I brought up was uh, the challenges that we have with District 5, geographic challenges with it. Uh, obviously, it's it's huge, and as uh, was pointed out, it's uh, there's a lot of open areas that don't have much of a population, but the uh, population is predominantly in the Auburn area right now. The balance is probably about 25 percent to 75 percent of the Auburn area, and uh, our understanding of some of the numbers that are coming uh, is that the uh, the permanent residents. In Tahoe, the numbers are coming down. As a lot of homes are turning over and turning into second homes, uh, we're hearing maybe it's potentially a 24% drop in population in the Tahoe region. And so that's going to exacerbate the problem of redistricting to try to balance those populations. Uh, we as a commission, uh, as the Charter Review Committee, tried to see if there was a way to resolve it. And as Clayton mentioned, we couldn't come up with anything that was going to work. Even coming up with seven districts didn't really resolve the issue. It only really made it worse. So, uh, Commissioner Severson, I'd like to say there's a solution, but there is nothing that we could find. And we really looked, turned over every stone looking for one. Because it's, I, to show you the imbalance there as well, that district has seven MAC meetings, which are, uh, or eclipse everybody else's. Most of the others have maybe three, even maybe two uh, MAC meetings. And so my concern is, as we look at moving down the hill, 
we're going to have uh, we're going to just make that issue worse. And so it needs to be done in a very logical fashion. And my recommendation to the, your commission as the kind of hearing body for this is that all of Auburn needs to be in district, including North Auburn, needs to be in district five because it makes sense. Right now you're sort of dividing the community. And so it needs to, I think, take in all of Auburn because that makes more logical sense. The issues of Auburn are not just the city of Auburn, it's all of Auburn. If you did not look at it that way, you'd have to push it down more into the Newcastle, Penryn area, more on the south side, and that would just add more MAC meetings. You'd probably add two, maybe three, if you have to go into the part of Loomis. Right now, District 5 already it comes to the Auburn MAC meeting, so it's already covered. So I would encourage you to really look at that as a more logical way to do it is just to have the Auburn area in the, in the new district. Now, that will, the current supervisor is going to be, he will end up in the new District 5. But he doesn't have to move until, unless he decides to, to rerun in 24. Then he would have to move for that seat. Thank you, Wayne. Sure. Thank you. Other persons in the audience who'd like to speak? Good morning, Commissioners. My name is John Melrose. I live in the massive metropolis of Tahoma on the shores of Lake Tahoe. I beg your indulgence. I had a surgery, so sometimes my voice goes away. So, please. I just want to make sure that the point is not lost on the Commission of how bad it is in Tahoe. I called 911 last week and they couldn't find my address. When they found my address, they said I was in El Dorado County. El Dorado County is across the street from my house. On my street, I am one of four houses that is occupied full time. There are about a dozen houses on that street. We have people who have moved up from the Bay Area to work remotely, and now they are living there full time. They may say, They may say their home address is still in the Bay Area, but it is not. Commissioner Sevenson hit it on the head. Living in Tahoe, if I were to go to the store <clears throat> on a Friday afternoon from my house, it will take me two hours, and I live seven miles from the store. There was a car accident yesterday morning, and we couldn't get out of our neighborhood for about four hours. It is very, very, very tight. It's also very, very, very rural. And District, District 5 will push into Penryn and possibly Newcastle, possibly this year just from the data that I've looked at myself. That is a lot of territory to cover for one commissioner, and she does a fantastic job. Unfortunately, she is one vote, and we will always lose to what the rest of the county wants. It's just a simple matter of math. I don't know what, if anything, can be done. I'm not that smart, but I surely would like other folks who are way smarter than me to try to come up with some kind of ideas and most importantly, engage us who live there. I looked at the, at the meetings that are scheduled for the redistricting aspect of this and I saw none in Lake Tahoe, none. I am assuming that some will eventually come up there but for folks who live there, we just assume none will come. And that's unfortunate. Everyone I talk to, I say it will come. You just have to trust that it will. To which case, the majority of the folks I talk to say, no, it won't because it never has. And I just really hope that the redistricting folks take a good hard look at how the far eastern part of the county still belongs to the county. The last point I will make is I'm looking at getting on a couple of the commissions and during the interview process, I had a lady who was on the commission ask, well, Lake Tahoe's not in Placer County, is it? And she's lived here for 45 years. So that was a little disconcerting and actually moved me to come down here. And for that, I greatly appreciate the ability to come speak. I wish you all a good day. Thank you so much. Others in the audience who want to speak? And Sue, do we have any raised hands? Oh, just a minute, we have somebody coming for us. 
Good morning, Jane Christensen, uh, Assistant County Executive. I just wanted to point out for the gentleman who just spoke that we have just published, and it will be on our website this afternoon, the additional community meetings on redistricting. There is one scheduled for Monday, August, August 2nd, at the Tahoe City Public Utility District meeting room. And again, those details will be on our website this afternoon. Thank you. All right, anyone else in the audience? If not, Sue, you said there is raised hands. All right. Mr. Griffin, please state your name. You'll have three minutes. Okay, thank you. My name is Paul Griffin. Uh, I live in Roseville, and as you know, we did the redistricting process, uh, which actually kicked off in 2019. Um, having been through the process, um, not so much on the commission, but actually watching the process itself, I have several questions that we encountered going, as a city uh, going through this. Um, and I think it's more concerning as a voter that should have the right to elect their district representation that they actually get a voice to be able to do so. Um, what happened during the process here in our city was that there was a vacancy, uh, multiple vacancies that, re that occurred because of redistricting. And uh, the board basically uh, installed people on an at-large basis. And now we're not going to have an ability to vote for our district for two years until the next election. So a few of my questions I want to bring up because they will come up again, I'm sure, throughout this process. And, I, and the, the first one is, in the event of this redistricting process results in a need to adjust your charter or your regulations, how will those propositions be presented to voters and also how soon? Um, I noticed that Placer County, uh, the board elected to go to a kind of a, a hybrid uh, redistricting commission, whereas the city of Roseville, we went independent. So one of the slides showed that the Board of Supervisors being involved throughout the process versus being at the very end and actually listening to the public and then, you know, uh, presenting their votes on behalf of their constituents. So will the board, uh, any board or supervisor recuse themselves in any way if the process affects them personally or professionally? Uh, if they have an interest in a particular district over another. Um, and then if a redistricting does result in a vacancy, how soon will voters in a district be provided the opportunity to vote? Like I said, waiting two years uh, when someone's installed in an at-large basis is, is kind of extreme. Um, and on the, on the other hand, going you know, 60 days after the vacancy doesn't give an opportunity for people to go out and actually garner the support and gather voters. So maybe a biannual vote uh, when a vacancy comes up in a special uh, election would be appropriate. And then lastly, I think one of the uh, one of the people online here or in the audience asked a question about the lakes. Um, you know, I live here no, near Granite Bay, and it uh, it would seem reasonable that the shores of both Lake Tahoe and um, Folsom Reservoir uh, be considered that there's more than one district that actually utilize them and more than one district that could potentially live along those shorelines. So will the shorelines be divided uh, by districts or is it just going to be encapsulated in a single district? And I thank you for allowing me this time to speak. Thank you so much for the presentation as well. Thank you. Sue, other commenters? Okay. Ms. Crawford, please state your name. You'll have three minutes. Thank you very much for the opportunity to address the Planning Commission as the Advisory Redistricting Commission. I live in Roseville, also in District 1, and I have um, a few basic comments. One, I don't believe that this should be counted as a public meeting since it's held during the day and it does not provide for people who have to work to be able to participate. So I would hope that in the future your meetings are scheduled in the evenings or on the weekends when more public participation can be generated. Um, my next comment has to do about District 5. I recognize the seriousness of the issues in District 5. However, uh, because of the regulations regarding population, 
until the county agrees to develop for permanent residency more of the properties within District 5, that will be an ongoing problem. So um, we in Western Placer, we see lots of interest in the county developing uh, Western uh, Placer. And we see plans going out 10, 15 years to take things out to the Sutter County line, down to the Sacramento County line. Tremendous traffic impacts from those huge developments. And part of that you'll see when you get the final census data will show you that a great deal of the 10% population increase is all down here in Western Placer. So um, I think that as a planning commission, you need to be looking at how you're going to balance the needs of Tahoe by encouraging more permanent residencies in there, and that should be part of your planning for the next decade or more to help balance that out. Um, and then my last point is, is that um, I would hope that in a couple of years when the um, rechartering process happens again for the county, that people look again at the issue of an independent redistricting commission, because I believe that the uh, perception of the fact that the planning commission is appointed by the, by the supervisors themselves creates a potential conflict of interest for the supervisors as well as possibly some planning commissioners. So um, I am greatly in favor of the independent redistricting commission which we put on the charter in Roseville and it was passed by a large majority of our residents. Independent redistricting commissions are the future. We have them at the state level, we have them at the city levels, and I believe that the county should get on board. So thank you very much for your time and attention to this matter. Thank you. Are there raised hands? Okay. Mr. Garabedian, you'll have three minutes. Thank you. Good morning, commissioners. Morning. Uh, good late morning. Mike Garabedian, live in Lincoln. <coughs> uh, though I'm very active uh, as a, a trade in forestry and on natural resources issues. Uh, I mainly have a number of questions. Uh, I've I shaped up three so far and uh, an observation or two. The, the first question is about the Placer County Water Agency. Uh, I guess it's a two-part question. Does that have to be the same uh, boundaries as the Board of Supervisors for their districts? And if not, who, who decides what the PCWA districts would be? Uh, so that's the first question. Um, and the staff mentioned a balancing urban and rural. And I wonder if there could be some explain, uh, further explanation of what that means uh, to balance urban and rural. I, I don't think it means mixing them together, uh, but, but I'm just not sure. Just some clarification about that would help. And then I also wonder uh, about the age, aging community uh, if that comes up in redistricting, I really, I just don't have any idea. I, uh, Lincoln has a, a very high percentage of aging, I think something like 14% or something. So those are my three questions. I have an observation about size. Uh, I don't, I suspect, at least my initial thinking, is that size by itself, I, I don't know if that should be a limiting factor. If you think of our assembly members and senators, they represent many counties uh, in, the, in the state legislature and the Board of Equalization, these massive, so I'm just not size of, certainly the, the MAC, and there are MAC and other issues, about, many issues about the size, but um, it's, it's enough to get, coming over the Sierras is a major hurdle and that one has to be done anyway. Um, and finally, I, I know this is a very serious matter, but uh, I can't help but say in answer to Mr. Sevenson that, uh, Commissioner Sevenson, is that the answer to his problem would be to give trees the vote. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Thank you. Other comments? Yep. We've been pining for that answer. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't resist. Mr. Halden, please state your name. You'll have three minutes. 
Thank you. Um, it's Bill Halden uh, from the city of Rockland and just wanted to uh, commend you for the laying out the uh, requirements uh, for this process and in particular uh, the state and federal requirements to keep uh, local jurisdictions uh, together as a community of interest. Uh, we in Rockland are very interested in being uh, kept together as a community. Our population uh, can be kept in one district and uh, we have uh, unique things that draw us as a community uh, together uh, and, and for our representation. I'd also note that Rockland has seen uh, a significant increase uh, in uh, our Asian population, which um, uh, I think also should be a consideration in keeping us uh, together. Um, I, additionally, um, a comment was made about uh, PCWA. Uh, it, Rockland is the only large city in uh, Western Placer actually that completely relies on PCWA to handle all of our uh, water issues. There's no wholesale agreement uh, to the city. PCWA uh, controls everything for us and uh, it would be great for there to be, uh, for Rockland to be kept together for that PCWA uh, district as well um, uh, going forward. Uh, lastly, a little history for Rockland. Uh, we, we've we've uh, aspired to be kept together in the past in the 90 redistricting. Uh, we were split between District 2 and District 4. In the 2000 redistricting, we were split between District 2 and District 3. And in the 2010, we were also split as a community uh, between District 2 and District 3, although the lines uh, changed considerably. Uh, so the city was split up in a different way uh, every 10 years. So um, again, we don't have enough people to make up a whole district, but uh, we certainly could be paired uh, with some rural uh, neighbors uh, and to, uh, to, to make up a district and um, make sure that uh, all of our uh, interests are, are represented well uh, before the Board of Supervisors. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Please state your name for the record. You'll have three minutes. Uh, Hi, good morning. My name is Cheryl Berkema. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, I would like to second what uh, Mr. Halden just uh, presented about the rural nature and our uniqueness and um, desire to stay so and desire to stay intact. Um, I think that uh, that also the um, there's a usability problem with getting the information out. Not only is uh, um, someone mentioned prior is it difficult for people to attend these meetings, but um, I, I don't think you're actually reaching a lot of the audience. So I haven't seen anything on like next door. I think um, next door and Facebook are heavily um, utilized in our area. I, I would hope there would be a public announcement. And in terms of usability also, people don't have time to or the inclination often to read, you know, hundreds of pages of things. I would hope that not only would you put the link to the site, a quick schedule of the meetings, and then the um, there was a video that was about a half hour, so it kind of described the whole process for people that are visual rather than um, reading, and that the actual full day um, be posted just as a link. So some some quick usability tips so that um, you get more engagement. I, I don't know how many people are actually watching today, but it would seem like you're not really reaching the audience. And the Placer newsletter, um, I know it goes to like uh, several thousand people, but you're representing many, many more, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. So maybe looking at um, more social media um, and, and getting that survey out there. I also share the concerns about the um, uh, not having an independent redistricting. It seems like there's a, there's a common theme of having supervisors appoint, you know, leave early, appoint your, your successors. And um, I think that having an actual process uh, that takes care of redistricting would be a, a more fair process. Um, to handle. So um, thank you very much for allowing my comments and great presentation. Thank you very much. 
Next. That's, That's okay. it. All right. So at this time, I will close the public hearing. And uh, could you answer questions, Nikki? I'll just share a few things sort of working backwards from um, uh, Ms. Berkema's last comment. So uh, we, uh, you know, our, our public information office is, is involved in the process, so we'll check with them on social media posts. They should be doing them on Nextdoor, Facebook, and, and the like. Um, uh, this flyer is going out with um, tax bills, uh, and so it'll go to all the um, uh, uh, homeowners in Placer County. So, uh, you know, we're, we're going to do our best to, to ramp up that effort on making sure individuals know how to participate in the process. Um, it was also mentioned that, um, oh, evening meetings. So we will be holding an evening meeting uh, in, the, in the fall. Um, and then the meetings that are going to be held over the course of the summer, uh, by and large, are in the evening, so 5 o'clock and after. Uh, the, the Tahoe City Public Utility District meeting is from 4 to 5 p.m., but you'll see these on the website. Um, so those, those will hopefully help to engage people who are working uh, during the day. And then to address Mr. Garabedian's concerns, um, yes, PCWA uh, lines are coterminous. I, I don't know the reason why, uh, but um, uh, that is uh, uh, something that we're considering. He made a comment also about, um, you know, why consider urban-rural? Obviously, the county is a very big mix of uh, urban, suburban, and very different flavors of rural throughout. Um, and the consideration was just to make sure that that issue is top of mind for the people representing each district if in fact and this is local criteria this is something we can certainly talk about that should every district member should every supervisor represent urban and rural constituents that's a question that we sort of put out there so uh, that was uh, that was the the context of that it's it's not a hard and fast criteria but a consideration that we'd put out there um, and then as far as you know aging populations um, you know, so long as there are issues-based concerns, uh, and they can be mapped related to, you know, if, if there are issues-based things tied to age, then, you know, those can be submitted through, through the survey. Thank you. Commissioners, you have questions of Vicki? What are we going to do? Uh, we wait until we have the next meeting on redistricting. <laughs> Mr. Chair. Yes, Sam. I'm tired of hearing stories about how District 1 is misrepresented because they have the preponderance of the population in the county. Um, we need to look at that more fairly. It's just not right. That's all. All right. Thank you. Other commission points? All right. If no further uh, discussion, then... Uh, this item is concluded. I'm going to request we take a five minute break before we start the Kim, Kim conditional use permit modification. We'll be back then in, let's see, what time is it now? At 11.30.
party today? You're ready. Well, as long as okay. Ready, we're <laughs> I want to bring the uh, Placer County Planning Commission back to order. Uh, we are moving into our third timed item, the continuation of the Kim conditional use permit modification, third party appeal. Members of the public may now raise their hands, press star nine if you're calling in to begin queuing in for the public comment on this item, which will not begin until the item presentation is complete. Amy again is going to make this presentation. Uh, so Amy, it's on, ready for you. Perfect, thank you. So my name is Amy Rossig with the Placer County Planning Services Division. The item that I have before you right now is a continuance from your June 10th Planning Commission hearing regarding the Kim Conditional Use Permit Modification Appeal. <coughs> so just a very quick recap of where we are in the county. We're located in the Granite Bay community just north of Douglas Boulevard and to the west of Barton Road um, in right off of the Barton Ranch Court. The project site is located in the Barton Ranch subdivision. This property is identified as Lot 4. There are some development requirements with this property as it is restricted to one story or 25 feet in height. Um, there is a landscaping easement along the rear of the property and the lot is limited in development to 20% lot coverage. And in January of this year, we received a request from the property owner to increase that lot coverage from 20% to 23% in order to construct two covered porches, a covered patio, and a future shade structure. And in March of this year, that request was approved by the zoning administrator, and then it was subsequently um, appealed and was brought before you and your commission on June 10th of this year. And at that hearing, the commission chose to um, take it back to staff to create findings which are found in your staff report regarding CEQA and to support the appeal and overturn the zoning administrator's decision. So those uh, findings have been provided to you in your report. Um, so with that, I have provided this recommendation to you based on the direction that you provided during the June 10th hearing, and I'm available if you have any questions. Okay. Uh, commissioners, do you have any questions of Amy? Okay, at this point in time then, uh, let's see, the appellant would be first, and then after that, the uh, property owner. So does the appellant have anything to say at this time? Good morning, Holly Johnson. Oh, you, please come up to the microphone for. Good morning, I'm Holly Johnson. My husband, Tom Hillislin, is here as well. I think we'll just rest, so it's not rest, so to speak, but what we already discussed for quite a bit of time on June 10th, and if there's anything further, we could reserve the right to say something at that time. All right, thank you. And is a property owner in the audience? Hello, my name's Paul Bianchi. I'm part of Bianchi Tillet Developers. Um, I'm the general contractor that the Kims hired to build their home. Um, just before hiring me, they hired Pete Lugo to create the design for their home. Um, so. I'm just going to tell it my layman's term um, what the, how the Kims feel about it. So they, they understood when they bought the lot that that was one of two lots could not be a two-story. Those, those two lots wanted single story only, and I think that's so they wouldn't be looking down at the neighbors who have been there for quite some time. So they agreed to that, and we all thought that sounded fairly reasonable, not, not that big of an issue. Um, Pete designed them a house that took up well, with the house and the porches and things he put on the, on the site plan, it took up 20.7 percentage of the lot. And, and that wasn't his goal. He was, he was just designing the house that the Kims wanted. And so then he, well, he may have already known, but it, it was then brought to Kim's attention that this house is actually bigger than the allowable 20 percent, but several of the other lots in the subdivision are allowed to have 23 percent footprint. So we thought, well, it seems logical. Maybe we can get 23%. Kind of part of it is because the other lots have 23% allowable footprint and a two-story. So it could be twice as big as the Kim's house. So we originally were going to say, can we just have 20.7% just so we can build the house as is? Then we realized everyone else had 23% or several others had 23%. And, and then Pete Lugo decided, you know, it would be nice to be able to build a shade structure out by the pool of some sort. And there was a requirement, uh, request by the 
the neighbors that that be less than 13 percent. And we've agreed to, to, if we build a safe structure, it's not necessarily going to happen, that it would be 10 feet only. So we're here hoping just if we could have the 23% allowable lot coverage still stand on the, the one story, so we're not going to have a two story. Um, seems reasonable to us. So I'm sure there's some other <laughs> items that I, I don't know about, but that's how, we, that's how we see it, and so we're here to request that. All right. Thank you so much. Yep. Thank you. Commissioners, do we have any question of the uh, appellant or the landowner? If not, uh, it's time for a public uh, hearing on this. Um, is there anyone in the audience who wants to speak? I don't see any, so is there anyone online who wants to speak? All right. With that, we close the public hearing, bring it back to the commission uh, for any staff response. I don't see any need, so. Uh, discussion of the commission? Hmm. Um, this is, yeah, sorry, I was reading my numbers that I don't have it last week. Um, when the builder said that the other applicants or the other lots have 23% compared to their 22 or 20%, that still gives the 20% coverage on a larger lot that they have, gives them more square footage for a house. So to increase theirs is going to increase their ability to go bigger go bigger or the other people will not because then they're gonna to have to come with to us as well and ask for that variance okay so not that they can have a bigger house the kims can still have a bigger house because of the maximum you take 20 percent of twenty nine thousand square feet so okay all right boy it's tough. I, we're getting down to picking the specks out of the sand. Uh, <clears throat> you're suggesting that we bring the coverage down, or no? What I'm what I'm saying is that if you look at what was originally approved that the larger lot is only allowed a 20% footprint, which would give them, if it's 29,999 square feet, that gives them almost a 6,000 square foot house they could build. If you drop it down to the other ones, those guys are only allowed like 5,200 square feet. So, go ahead. Just the footprint. Just the footprint. But but that's what they signed up for. That's what was approved. So we're going based on what was approved and what is on this piece of paper. So if we're going to set a precedence for them to go at 23%, why can't 23% go to 27%? Well, that was my point, is that okay. they're allowed already, you know, a pretty big footprint to build a house on, considering the size of their lot. So that's all. Sam, uh, comment? Well, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, I actually have no problem with this uh, the project per se. I mean, what the uh, appellant has said is accurate. I mean, it's only a marginal difference in size on the on the uh, the footprint. So, therefore, that's my opinion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you. Um, we have a public comment, so I will open up uh, for public comment again. Uh, take this one comment, and so open that up, please. Hi, Cheryl Berkman. Thank you for allowing me to uh, speak. Um, the the surrounding neighborhood um, went to great lengths in public forums to review a document and the rules are clear if i agree with the um the appellant that the precedent setting nature of changing the rules on the fly and creating variances um, creates not only hardships for those within potentially that this that um, subdivision 
but we'll, for the neighbors also, all of a sudden, then it creates a, well, we're handicapped because they went into our setbacks. So um, we're already experiencing that. It's actually creating more problems down the road than it's solving. And an architect's job is to draw within the current codes and, and um, to come back later and say, well, it's only 2%. It's only breaking the rules. So their job is to know what the codes are, to draw the footprint within what is allowed. So I think that that was feasible. There's plenty of space. I'm not saying that people shouldn't have big houses, but when you look at a lot of that area, a lot of that area came from you know the 80s and 90s, and there's a lot of smaller rural residential homes. So it's to start tweaking the thousands of feet that you can have is just creating more and more problems for the neighbors and the character of the neighborhood. And as one of the commissioners said last time, variances um, create problems with the Granite Bay Community Plan, and I don't think that it's appropriate to, to start doing that. It's going to cause more problems than it's worth. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any others? Oh, there is. Okay. Please state your name. You'll have three minutes. Sandra Harris. Okay, there you go. Um, okay, I wasn't sure who you were speaking to. Uh, yes, this is Sandy Harris, and I attended several hearings on this project as it was going through the process. And there were some pretty uh, definite parameters set out for all these different lots. And um, I've gone to hundreds of hearings, seems like. And, and many of them are with, deal with variances. And a variance here and a variance there. And why do we have conditions and rules if everybody can just come in on a whim and get a variance? So um, this is precedent setting for that project. Right now, there are two homes being built. And um, there are 10 lots in there. So there's a possibility that we could have seven more people coming in asking for variances because one was given. So anyway, that was my concern. And I brought that up in the zoning hearing that it was a precedent setting. Thank you. Thank you. Any others? Not at this OK, point. so we'll close the public hearing again. You know, my thoughts um, is I don't believe that we should you know, given the uh, discussions, uh, extensive discussions in the subdivision and the conditions placed on it, I don't think it is appropriate for the Planning Commission to uh, modify those. I think it's important to stick with the recommendations that were developed in public meetings and public hearings. So uh, my feeling is uh, this should not go forward as, as shown, but the project should be designed within the, the constraints uh, that were placed uh, in the subdivision. Any other commissioner discussion? I will agree with the chair. Commissioner Cannon here. Okay. And yeah, that's fine. If necessary, make a recommendation. If you put it up there so I can see it. It should be up there, uh, Sam. Grant the third party appeal. No. I don't know if you can see that or not. What we could do is maybe have somebody else make the motion and read it and then you can second it. So Anthony, do you want to do that? I'll make the motion that uh, we grant the third party appeal and overturn the zoning administration's decision to approve the project, resulting in a denial of the conditional use permit modification subject to the findings contained in the staff report. Did you get that, Sam? I'll yeah, second. I'll second him, of All course. Right. We have a first and a second. Roll call, please. I have a first from Mr. DiMatteo, a second from Mr. Cannon. So vote for Mr. Cannon, please. Yes, ma'am. Mr. DiMatteo? Yes. Mr. Sevison? Yes. Mr. Hauge? Yes. Thank you. Clayton, can this be appealed? Yes. Okay. So let me read the statement then that the decision of the Planning Commission may be appealed by anyone who appeared at today's hearing and provided comment or anyone that submitted written comments on this item. 
An appeal must be filed within 10 days of today's date and shall be accommodated by a filing fee of $619. Okay. With that, this meeting is adjourned.